The death of a golden retriever in New York has rocked a progressive enclave in Brooklyn, New York. So on August 3rd, in the neighborhood of Park Slope, New York, a woman was walking her dog at around 6 a.m. when she was attacked by a homeless man. The attack caused her dog's death. And the woman posted on a neighborhood app next door about her experience. She called for the man to be arrested, but nothing was done. Instead of the man's arrest, her post on the app blew up an argument about social justice. Now, two months after the attack, members of the community are still arguing about whether the homeless attacker should be arrested or whether his welfare should be prioritized. Others online have commented that arresting the man would exacerbate systemic racism, as he is black and the dog owner is white. The woman attacked says, I think that there should be more resources for them. But what I emphasize is that this is just one person who needs to be removed from the park. He's violent. End of story. And so then the New York Times had a write-up of this story. So there's both, I saw Barry Weiss's Substack had a version of it, and then the New York Times had a write-up that was really, uh, look, I, I think would make a lot of people angry in the way they, they framed this. Like they consulted some bioethicists who are saying, ah, I don't know, what to be done? I think most people will say, this is not okay and something needs to be done about someone who, who beat a dog to death, right? I mean, this is not, this is not, like, are we just supposed to accept that this is how cities have to be now? I don't think so, but I think this also plays into a very harsh side of the rights rhetoric when it comes to crime. Um, the majority, the overwhelming majority, over 97% of those who are homeless are at no risk to anyone, essentially other than themselves. They're not going to be violent. They're not, you know, expressing any of that in this case, I guess he's in the other 3%. Mm -hmm. And there has to be some level of recourse for that because you can't go around, you know, threatening people's lives or scaring them or, you know, giving them bodily injury or their dogs. I'm a right. huge dog lover, but it's one of those things where I feel like uh, certain advocacy groups have taken the wrong side of this. And I say that as somebody who is hashtag Black Lives Matter. I believe in the mantra. I believe in um, mm -hmm. ensuring that equity happens, particularly for a community that has fallen under the weight of systemic racism for generations. But with that being said, I wouldn't have cared if this guy was a white guy. At the end of the day, right. he killed somebody's dog. Right. At that point, there is something that needs to be done. And I think that, again, um, sometimes people take on these right. personal missions that aren't exactly necessary, and it waters down the whole point of the movie. Because in this case, it was you, you had the racial breakup that way. But you know, in, some, in, in many of these communities where you have, again, I, I agree with you that it's not like all homeless people by any stretch of the imagination, but where you're seeing you know, these videos of crime on the subways, or you know, people being attacked, or punched, or knifed. I mean, I, the victims sometimes are, are black. Uh, maybe they live in underprivileged neighborhoods where this kind of thing is more common. And so it doesn't feel, you know, it doesn't feel like racially tolerant, like, because they're the victims too. Exactly. And we know that violence happens in proximity. Proximity, violence, most violent crime or most crime in general is people who look like the community they actually live in. Mm -hmm. White areas of, of white communities have more crime that is contributed by white people because they live amongst each other. Mm -hmm. Black communities have more crime amongst black people because they are closer to and live in the same communities as people who look like them. Part of that is the segregation of housing in our, in our society. But I'm a native of Chicago. Um, there are certain places that you know not to go at a certain time of day or any time of day. But with that being said, you also fully recognize that there are crime issues that have existed in certain communities across this country, specifically large urban centers, for decades now. And at this point, I think post-pandemic, we're seeing crime levels go up, specifically violent crime, for several reasons. One is going to be mental health. We also have a, a high housing crisis. We also have people who can't make ends meet. And when those things all come together, in addition to our nation's drug problem, right. we're going to see the same levels or close to the same levels of violence that we saw during the crack epidemic. That's just kind of how it happens. Violence is cyclical, but we know what the causes are. And instead of actually addressing those, in most conversations, we see demonization of individuals or certain communities rather than having the conversation about how we reduce crime, because we absolutely know how. We just don't want to invest in it. Well, I, the drug problem is really key because you know so many of the, so many of the people we interact with in D.C., New York, wherever it is, I, I see people who are having psychotic episodes and are, are drug addicts, and they need treatment um, and, and it's it's very we can't look I, I don't want to send the police round up everybody either but clearly they, there needs I think there needs to be some level of coercion involved to get people to take medicine they need is it doesn't feel humanitarian to me to leave these people on the street e even if they're not stabbing somebody else they're, they're shaking they're thrashing they're having vivid hallucinations like I don't, I'm not okay with that. No, you're absolutely correct. Um, I remember going to Seattle, and this was pre the um, the pandemic. And downtown Seattle, you see people who are largely white people who are literally having episodes in the middle of the street. 
and yeah. people just walk by like it's nothing. The majority of these are individuals who have, you know, used drugs to help eradicate some of their mental health issues. And in some cases, drug use in and of itself creates mental health issues. So it can be, you know, one side or the other. But our system of health care does not provide um, the opportunity or the access levels that we need for people who have mental health issues. Even for those who actually have insurance, most insurance only covers mental health up to a certain point or, you know, a number, a set number of sessions, five, seven, whatever. Um, for those who I don't use those have in any, two days. Exactly. And somebody who does I'm it, I'm like, I, I, I need my, my therapy and I believe in therapy. But I think that it's very serious that we understand that it is costly. Mental health is costly. And we have a nation that does not value it or does not put money where its mouth is. Uh, again, in my hometown of Chicago, under Rahm Emanuel, we lost over 30 mental health clinics. Um, there is a cost to society when that happens. Yeah. Yeah. No. It, it, and, and, we're all, and we all pay for it. We all pay for it. Then we end up with these spaces in cities that are not usable anymore because they're filled with people who are having real are, who are in real distress and need help and it's not and it's not okay and it just feels like it's getting worse everywhere. It absolutely is. I don't think that there is a race or socioeconomic status to mental health. We know yeah. that there are rich people who have these issues, there are yeah. middle class people, poor people at all education levels. What we do know is that, you know, issues like anxiety have gone up significantly amongst the younger generation. Um, depression as well. We know that suicide rates have gone up specifically amongst kids. A lot of that as a result of bullying and social media attacks and things like that. Um, back in the day when we used to get bullied, probably, you know. <laughs> that was bad too. It was bad, but yeah. like I didn't have to worry about the whole world seeing it in yeah. a five second clip. Today yeah. you do. So it's a, it's a much different type of thing. And I think that we as a nation need to be more cognizant of how to address these issues and to put the money where it needs to go in terms of eradicating some of what we're seeing. Because if we don't, we're going to see more videos like that, more dog attacks, more people attacks. We're yeah. going to see a different level of danger and risk if we don't address it very soon. Absolutely. That's something we'll continue to cover here and continue to follow. And we'll be back with more Rising in just a minute. Stay with us.